Hello students, welcome back to our discussion of Chapter 8, Regional Economic Integration. Um, so, similar to what we have discussed before in that there is potential for trade blocks to uh, create trade and trade blocks to uh, prevent trade. Um, as it says there, the benefits of the regional integration determined by the extent uh, of which they tra create trade versus um, um, trade diversion. So trade creation occurs when high cost domestic producers are replaced by low cost producers within that free trade area. So um, let's imagine that there is a new regional economic integration uh, partnership or deal struck bet uh, between two countries. So Previously, you would have your domestic producers producing that product, but now they are being replaced by low-cost producers from another country within that free trade area. So, in essence, it creates trade. It's not good for the domestic producers, but it does create trade. Trade diversion occurs when the low-cost external suppliers are replaced by high, um, higher-cost suppliers within the free trade area. So, once again, um, you form a new partnership or a new agreement, regional economic uh, deal. So before you would have um, suppliers outside of your country supplying you products. You know, they are low cost external suppliers, but now you sign that agreement and that agreement does not include them as one of the countries in your trade block. So now you can't, as a nation or a company, trade with your previous external suppliers. You are forced to um, trade with suppliers from within that free trade area and if they are higher cost there's going to be less trade um, going on now. So we, we get into the concept of trade diversion. So continuing on we're going to talk a little bit of Europe for a moment or two. So in case you're wondering that is a map of Europe and we go briefly into the five main institu institutions in the European Union. Um, really, I don't want to go on record to, to say this, but it's not that important. So you, you got those five institutions, you can look over them. There might be a multiple choice question on one of those institutions um, in terms of uh, you know what they do. So the European Council, um, basically, ultimately controlling your um, authority within the uh, European Union. The European Ministers and Commission, they're responsible for proposing different legislation, implementing it, monitoring it um, by the member states. The European Parliament debates that legislation, and the Court of Justice, the Supreme Court, basically a um, there to uh, for appeals for any uh, European law. Um, then it gets into the chapter gets into the European Union. Who are the members? Um, really, too factual for exam purposes. Um, Ten nations joined 2014. Once again, um, not that important unless you're one of those countries. Uh, it's not a history course, so we don't go, go into the history of the European Union. Um, same thing there. Let's go into um, the benefits and costs um, of the European Union in terms of the common, cur uh, common currency. So, as it says there, there are some significant benefits. Individuals, businesses, businesses will have significant savings if there's one currency because there's no need for currency exchanges or um, any type of uh, process to and cost to keep and maintain various currencies in each nation. It makes it easier to compare prices. Um, the European unions, because prices will be lower, are forced to look for ways to reduce their production costs. Uh, to maintain, maintain profits. So, of course, reducing production costs, you might become more efficient at that. Some of the costs of having that European or that common currency in Europe 
is that the national authorities, each, gov each country has lost their control over their own monetary policy. Germany can't do something they want to do because Greece, for example, is having um, significant uh, economic uh, problems. So you would have, d each country would have the desire to have a different monetary policy, but of course, European Union would have one monetary policy. Um, cost, because they created the uh, European Central Bank, um, they, they are, are responsible to set interest rates, determine mon monetary policies for the uh, zone, for the for the, uh, the Eurozone, which creates problems because, as I said, Greece and Germany, Italy may need different things, which gets us, gets us into another drawback that's not mentioned on this uh, slide, but it's important. The textbook mentions that it's the optimal currency area or zone. So the optimal currency area is a geographical region in which it would maximize efficiencies economic efficiencies to have the entire zone or area region sharing a single currency. However, if the area is too large or too diverse, such as Europe, even United States and Canada, um, it's too diverse. Um, one common um, uh, monetary policy would not be what each area, diverse area within uh, Europe, United States, or Canada needs. So, you know, it, it would be better to have more uh, internal exchange rates. So remember the days when Alberta was doing really well and the rest of Canada was not. The um, rest of Canada may have needed a different monetary policy than Alberta needed. But as one nation, you'd have one single monetary policy. So that problem is compounded in Europe where there's many different countries each dealing within their own countries with different issues as well, and then country to country uh, issues. So that single monetary policy would not work for large diverse countries. The case for NAFTA, we're gonna go over the case for NAFTA really briefly. Um, NAFTA changes so often, and it's just gone through another round of changes. Um, based on what it was originally intended for. And a lot of the stuff it was originally intended for and included, those goods and services um, may not uh, exist to the same um, level as they do now, or we may have different goods and services which were not originally included. So that is one of the issues that people fighting for or against NAFTA have always cited. Um, so, you can go through that. Basically, a case for NAFTA, um, lower restrictions, trade restrictions, more more free trade, uh, the better the um, economies are going to be for those nations. The case against uh, NAFTA, a lot of people believe that jobs would move to Mexico or low-cost areas. Some of that happened in, initially. A lot of those jobs were, or companies moved back to either Canada or the U.S., um, because there is uh, other differences that they didn't account for when they first moved there. Um, let's go into some other regional economic areas, the BRIC countries. Um, Brazil, Russia, India, China. In 2014, it pluralized with the addition of South Africa. So it's the BRICs now, but uh, that generally was the... Uh, Big four, largest economies outside of the um, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, there is a website of the countries that um, are part of OECD. You can just Google that, but uh, those are four large countries and economies that are not included in the OECD. Um, something about the BRIC countries, two are democracies, two have authoritarian regimes, and, you know, they still sign an agreement basically working together to reduce trades, uh, trade barriers. So this is, um, oops, let's go here. Um, before we go on to the CARICOM, just uh, some information about the, um, the Andean Pact and uh, Mercosur, 
that uh, your textbook alludes to that's not included in um, in the PowerPoint here. The Andean pack, we talked about that briefly, Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador, and Colombia, and Peru. Generally not successful. It was relaunched in 1990 as a customs union. Um, so that's something important to know. The Andean pact or Andean, Andean community is a customs union. Um, they signed an agreement with Mercosur in 2003 to create a free trade area. Mercosur, aka also known as a South Commons market, um, basically a trade pact between uh, Brazil and Argentina, later including Paraguay, Uruguay, and Venezuela. They may, however, this trade agreement may be diverting trade rather than creating trade, which is uh, something that generally is not um, desirable. So we can go into the CARICOM, a customs union with uh, Caribbean countries. Um, the CSME, Caribbean Single Market Economy, they've had difficulties um, getting off the ground and kind of uh, maintaining this agreement. Uh, it has failed repeatedly to progress toward that economic integration. Um, you know, they have just struggled with the various countries that are part of this um, agreement. Oh, there's the Andean pack. Sorry, Mercosur data I was reading before. So, of course, those are the uh, Andean pact is a customs union. Mercosur is a South Commons or Commons market. Is referred to as a South Commons market, and uh, they've gone through significant difficulties. Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, those are member countries that do not include China, Japan, or South Korea. Um, significant population base and diversity within um, that uh, association. And I think that is it for this uh, chapter, chapter eight. Um, some historical factual data available in this chapter, some economic political reasons to integrate, uh, and then the uh, five levels um, would be more or less what is, um, what's key for this chapter and understanding some of the benefits and costs of uh, the euro, the common currency in, in Europe.